Morning everyone, it's Sharon here from Climate Action North and I'm happy to introduce our next guest today which is Peter Cairns who is the founder and director of Scotland The Big Picture. Morning Peter, how are you doing? Good morning Sharon, very well thank you. Good, what's, up, what's going on in Scotland The Big Picture at the moment then? I'm hoping you're going to tell us a little bit about what you've been up to. Oh wow, well, straight in at the deep end. Um, yeah, I mean lots and lots of stuff going on. I suppose in the, in the sort of rewilding world which I find myself in um, there is a lot going on. It, it's, it's very exciting. It's also somewhat bewildering. Where do we start? Where do we end? Um, but yeah, lots and lots of stuff going on. Um, most of it very positive. Um, from the point of view of what we're involved with, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, all the usual politics and bureaucracy. Some of the most sort of more exciting, sexier headlines, if you like, is, I don't know, what are we doing? We're, we're embarking on, a, on the very early stages of, of the first step of a potential reintroduction of links. I know you spoke to my colleague David Hetherington about that. So that's potentially really exciting. That's really at the foundation stage. Um, we're about to launch, uh, again, an equally exciting uh, project called Northwoods, which is a, a rewilding network across Scotland made up predominantly of farmers, but not exclusively. Um, and I suppose the most exciting thing we're doing, from my point of view at least, is filming a, a feature length documentary called Riverwoods. Um, which uses the um, perilous state of Scotland's salmon populations to shine a light really on the degraded landscapes through which many of Scotland's rivers flow. Uh, but again, there's a lot of positive action taking place in that arena. So yeah, all good. Um, and, and as I say, equally ex exciting and bewildering in equal measure. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting what you said about Riverwood as well, because when I was talking to David, um, we were on about degraded landscapes and the the impact of climate change, I suppose, on the rivers and the water courses up in Scotland as well, about the, you know, the water heating up, which is actually causing a lot of problem for the species that, that live there, migrate there and whatever. So I think it's, it's important, isn't it, that you're looking at that as well as um, everyone thinks of Scotland as trees, Peter, or lack of trees, I suppose, because one of the things I always follow when, when you've been doing your talks as well is about everyone looks at Scotland's landscape at the moment as it is at the moment and thinks how beautiful it is. Of course it is in that state, but that's not really what it should look like, is it really? I know that's a big sort of, uh, a big question, but it is sort of um, a landscape that although it's beautiful, it isn't necessarily the right landscape, is it? Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, that question, what should Scotland look like, of course, depends on, on who you're asking. Um, but you're right in as much that we have, we have come to accept as normal the, the undoubted beauty and drama of Scotland's landscape, but without necessarily seeing the ecological depletion that has taken place over many, many centuries. This is not something that's happened recently. Um, so we, we, we suffer from a condition that I, I refer to as ecological blindness. We, we've, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a generation, as a population, we've never really lived in an ecologically rich landscape. Across the whole of Britain, our ecosystems are damaged, degraded, impoverished. So we've grown used to a nature depleted landscape. And, and, and bizarrely, we cherish it and, and celebrate it as normal, as what we're comfortable with. But as I say, at an ecological level, um, Britain and, and maybe Scotland in particular, or certain parts of Scotland anyway, are massively depleted from an ecological point of view. So, yeah, I mean, we, what we try and do is not necessarily get involved in, in what can be fractious discussions about what Scotland should look like. We try and portray a vision of what Scotland could look like in the future. And that's a Scotland that could be much more richer in, in terms of nature, but also serve um, the challenges around climate and also um, be of economic and social benefit to people. So, you know, from where I sit, rewilding is a win-win and then win again. Um, not everybody sees it like that, to be fair, but it is a mechanism that we can use to, to address the, the, um, the dual emergencies of climate breakdown and global biodiversity loss. Yeah, I mean, I mean, rewilding the term is, is a word in itself anyway that means a lot of things to a lot of, a lot of people, doesn't it? And I suppose it's, it's, you know, we, I mean, I've bought most of the Scotland Big Picture books and the Me Wilding book, which was a really good example of how rewilding could be brought down to grassroots level. You know, we can all do something to, to me wild and rewild our own little areas. So I suppose when you look at rewilding in all of its potential um, 
concepts, you know what I mean? You could be looking at sort of small scale right up to the big, big, big project. So it's a fascinating subject, I think, rewilding. Um, you know, and we've been doing quite a lot of work trying to raise awareness of that down here in the northeast as well. And, and that brings me to sort of some of the books that I've got, obviously. Um, I was just reading some of the Scotland the Big Picture book again this morning. And it's a really good book and I'll show everybody for the viewers that haven't seen it. So this is the book that everybody should have. Um, it's a really good book in terms of splitting out different um, categories, isn't it? So you've got the, 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 the blue area as well. You've got like a summit to see thing going on as well, haven't you, with all of the landscapes that you're looking at. And I really like the way it's broken up into wildness as well, you know, wild words from people. What, what made you write the book, Peter? I mean, I know you're one of the authors, aren't you? One of three, is that right? It's like three authors of the book? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Scotland, the big picture, if I just go back quickly, four years, I guess, um, really started off just as a book project. It was a story, the rewilding story, it wasn't necessarily called that at the time, but um, that story was evolving quite quickly. Um, and, and myself and a couple of colleagues just felt that it, that story needed documenting, it needed telling, because the wider world outside of the very insular conservation sector weren't necessarily aware of what was going on and, and why. Um, and so that was the motivation behind the book. Um, I think what we, I won't say discovered, but what, what was perhaps reinforced to us during the writing process was that rewilding, al although it manifests physically, it manifests in terms of restored forests, peatlands, naturalized, renaturalized rivers, species reintroductions, all of those sort of physical manifestations actually it's much more of a, of a philosophical change in mindset. It's a change, fundamental change in our relationship with nature. And so we very quickly realized that this wasn't a book about nature as such. This was a book about people's relationship with nature. And of course, as you alluded to, that relationship is very different for, for, for different people. So we've always tried to strike the balance between pushing new boundaries <clears throat> igniting new conversations and thought processes we think that's a good thing but we've always tried to avoid pointing the finger of blame of, of um, you know perpetuating this narrative of, of ecological despair I think the conservation community has been doing that for years I would argue it hasn't been particularly effective and I think what rewilding offers and what we've tried to articulate around that word is a, is a really positive progressive vision for the future. This is what our landscapes could look like. They could be richer in wildlife, they could serve climate, the challenges around climate change much more effectively, and actually they can be good for people as well, not only in, in terms of public health, but also in, in economic terms. So from where I sit, we, you know, I, I ask the question, what, what's not to like about it? You know, there's, there's, some, there's some tensions around the word itself but the philosophy behind rewilding, if it's articulated in its wholeness, really is a, is a no-brainer. It makes sense for, for, for people, for climate and for, and for nature. It really does. I totally agree. And are you seeing that people, I mean, obviously, when, when you're working with people every day, are you seeing that shift in change? Are you seeing that change in attitudes or not? Or are you seeing a bit of this and a bit of that? You know, it's, it's like a bit of positivity and you've still got people who are, it's like us with climate change, Peter. It's, it's the same thing with climate action. We see people who are stuck in that bubble and they won't move from the fact that, you know, there is no climate change and the change, you know, it isn't happening. And you just have to move on sometimes, I think, with that sort of, um, you know, reluctance to change, I suppose. But there are, for every sort of one that won't change, one person that won't change, there are three or four people that like the idea of that change. So is that a similar challenge for rewilding when you're working with people? It, it's that exactly, Yeah, exactly the same. Um, I mean, we, we learned a lot from, from marketing professionals and, and there's this, you know, this sort of typical demographic that they, that they portray whereby 20% of the population will always agree with almost anything you say. 20% of the population will never, ever agree with anything you say just because. Um, and then the 60% in the middle that are persuadable, so to speak. They are people that are receptive to, to new thinking, new ways of thinking and, and change. And I think, you know, one of the challenges around rewilding and, and certainly one of the real 
fears of the 20% that will never like rewilding is this perception that change is being imposed upon them. You know, they, 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 they like the way they live their lives. Um, and and this, this thing called rewilding is being forced upon them when they don't want it. And I think part of our job, at least, is to turn that change. And rewilding does represent change, both physical and philosophical. There's no doubt about that is to turn that change from a threat into an opportunity. Um, so again, it's about showcasing positive stories, informing and inspiring people um, to do things a little bit differently. But change, you know, for, as, a, as a species, we're not particularly adaptable to change. It's not something we're necessarily good at dealing with. Um, and rewilding does bring along change. So it, it's the management of that changing process. And it's no different to the journey that climate change has been on over the last, I don't know, what, 15 years or so. I, I often draw analogies with other other social changes um, like racism for example you know when I was 15 16 racism was just some abstract concept that nobody really took seriously fast forward 30 years 40 years that's how long it's taken um, and we now accept it as a normal part of societal conversation climate change is the same rewilding or nature recovery or ecological restoration or whatever you want to call it will be the same it, it's a journey it's a process and we're on it yeah thank goodness we are on it though really you know thank goodness we are trying to do something about it because we really do need to do that and i think rather excitingly as well is the story about the cairngorms connect as well isn't it i mean that's an incredible um group of people i suppose that are going to be on this journey you know in in scotland for the next is it 10 or 20 years i think is it something 200 Oh, sorry, <laughs> in 20, you need immediately though, you need to crack on, don't you, for the next 10 years, definitely, which is what we're saying. It's like all about the next 10 years. I think I was possibly thinking about the biodiversity challenge as well that we've got for the next 10 years with the UN as well. So we're trying yeah. to sort of do something about that. But yeah, a lot longer then. So what, what's, can you tell us a little bit about Cairngorms Connect? Because people who are watching this may not know that there is that group and that body of people making the changes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Please. Yeah, I mean, Cairngorms Connect is, is really, really interesting. Um, so in essence, this is a group of four landowners. Um, I say landowners, two of them are public agencies. One is, one is um, Nature Scott, who is the, the equivalent of Natural England in Scotland. One is Forestry and Land Scotland, used to be the Forestry Commission. So these are public bodies. One is a private landowner and one is a, um, an environmental uh, NGO, the RSPB. So these four landowners who just coincidentally happen to find themselves neighboring each other, all realized probably five, six years ago that they were kind of moving in the same direction. So this was moving away from, I suppose, traditional conservation, whereby historically, you know, we've, we've identified a species that's in trouble and we've tried to save that species. So it's been a quite a piecemeal approach. Uh, it's almost been, you know, saving the world species by species. I think we now know, ecologically, we now understand that, that that process is really treating the symptom rather than the cause. So the Cairngorms Connect partners are all committed to a much more holistic vision of landscape scale restoration, habitat restoration. And because they own big tracts of land and because they sit in uh, alongside each other, they're able to do that at scale. So this is a project covering 600 square kilometers right in the heart of the National Park, um, comprising elements of native woodland, um, peat, peatlands, rivers, lochs, mountains, the whole habitat profile. And they're really looking to restore ecological processes within those 600 square kilometers. I would call it rewilding. They definitely wouldn't call it rewilding. They'd call it ecological restoration. Personally, I don't care what you call it. They're doing some really, really good stuff. And already, and this is only, what, four or five years in, seeing some amazing results with species like Capercaillie, for example, which are really beleaguered across the rest of Scotland, are starting to show signs of recovery. Similarly, hen harriers, golden eagles. So already, and this is, you know, it takes a long, long time for landscapes to recover and to, to reignite, so to speak. Um, but already we're seeing some really positive signs. So I think as much as anything, it's a physical project with physical outcomes but it's also really symbolic and I, and I know one other project in particular and I'm sure there are others 
that is looking to mirror what Cairngorms Connect have set in motion. So not only is it, is it, a, is it a physical change, it's also setting in motion a set of, um, a set of philosophical changes across other, other land holdings in Scotland. So yeah, really exciting. Yeah, definitely one to watch, I think, Peter. It'd be really good to keep an eye on what's happening there. And I mean, we do get to hear about, you know, we obviously did last year, I think, on Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch. We're featuring Cairngorms Connect um, quite a lot during the programmes, weren't they? So it sounds an incredibly exciting um, project, I suppose, to keep an eye on. So I know your particular interest is um, ospreys, because I've obviously been watching a lot of the Scotland The Big Picture YouTube. I think people will, will hopefully share that channel, if you don't mind, as part of this talk, um, because there's some really good film work, obviously, on, on, the, on the channel. And one of them, one of the series is The On Assignment. I've been watching that, really enjoying those, um, those programmes. And obviously watching the Osprey one, because my official interest is you know following the flight of the osprey project so tell me about your interest in ospreys because i know that you've got a particular interest in them haven't you um i, I would i would disagree actually sharon i, I mean I, don't get me wrong i love ospreys <laughs> i wouldn't necessarily say i've got a particular interest in them i mean i, I have a i have an interest in in lots of species all species really but but there's no doubt that ospreys have, have struck a chord with, with not only with me but with a wide range of people I think that, I mean, in my particular case, I'm very lucky in as much that, you know, if I looked out my office door now, I can see an osprey nest. So, I, so there's a personal connection with ospreys. And of course, my local pair, I watch on an annual basis as to what they're doing. Um, but I think ospreys, as much as anything, I mean, they're a, they're a fantastic bird of prey. Of course, we, we recognize that. But I think probably more than anything, they're, they're symbolic. They're, they've come to represent a wildlife comeback. This is a species that was driven to extinction in, in 1916 and, and for 40, 50 years didn't, didn't exist in, in Britain. In the 1950s they started to recolonize and ever since then it's been, a, it's been a one of those rare conservation success stories. So I think the story of, of recovery if you like and the symbolism of hope that that story brings with it is really what's captured the public's imagination and continues to do so. So I think ospreys are a really valuable element of this rewilding story because not only are they a, a fantastic species in their own right, but they show, along with other species, a few other species, they show what is possible with a change of, of people's attitudes. And I think, you know, from my point of view, I would argue, well, we've, we've done it with ospreys as it happens, they've done it on their own. Um, you know, why can't we do it with a whole range of other species? And there have been, you know, there have been other reintroductions, red kites, sea eagles, more latterly beavers, um, but we still have a depleted portfolio of native species. Um, and I think ospreys are a, a beacon of hope, if you like, in, a, in an ocean of ecological despair. So what's the priorities then, Pete, that you think? It's like Cabocurly, is it Pine Mountain, Red Squirrel, Ospreys? Is, it, is there a certain set of species that you're really, really focusing on, you know, with, with rewilding? Or is it just everything has, you know, has to have that ability to come back? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I've drawn an analogy with a car engine. And, and I think before we start talking about rewilding, we, we maybe have to get our heads around the degree of dewilding that has taken place. I won't bore you with all the statistics, but suffice it to say that, you know, we have a, a, a massively impoverished diversity and abundance of species in, in Scotland and, and across Britain. So we're starting from a, a pretty low base baseline. Um, rewilding seeks to return that abundance and diversity of life. So it's not necessarily about individual species. Some of those species, like the beaver, for example, play a a really important role in that process <clears throat> excuse me but they are only one component of the engine and rewilding is really about making sure that engine is complete and it functions as effectively as it can and I think what's happened of course across the course of history is that we've a removed certain components of that engine and b allowed other components to start to wear um, without replacement. So we've, we've got an ecological engine that I would argue is, is at present faltering and if we carry on without addressing that ultimately it's going to stop as engines do. 
So I think it's not necessarily about individual species, it's about the system, the ecological engine, and making sure that if that functions right, then all the individual components of the engine will, will be fine. So it's about interrelationships, interdependency, and the wholeness and complexity of nature, rather than individual elements of it. Yeah. And so reintroduction, though, is yeah. the only one that you're looking at at the moment is possibly the links. Is this that one of the projects that are happening or might happen? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I mean, large carnivore reintroduction is a, is a contentious issue. There's no doubt about that. I think it's fair to say that for the last 15, 20 years or so, the, the rewilding conversation has been dominated by wolves. Um, there, there's lots of different reasons why rewilding has become synonymous with wolves and, and perhaps also the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, the, um, the removal of people from the landscape. So, you know, rewilding objectors or opponents often cite that, you know, large carnivores in means people out. And, and that in Scotland in particular has echoes of the, of the clearances. So rewilding has connotations with depeopling. And we, we have to, to move away from that. But returning to large predators, for us, it's not necessarily about introducing individual species. It's about restoring dynamic natural processes. And a major element of those processes is predator-prey interactions. You know, there's been huge amounts of research elsewhere that proves that if you take those large apex predators away, then again, it's about like the car engine, the whole system starts to break down. So what we're looking to do in reintroducing the links is to reignite those processes. So yes, links are charismatic, beautiful animals, no doubt about that, but actually that's not the motivation. The motivation is not what they are, it's what they do and what effect they have on the landscape. So again, our, our thought process is always, is always about how can we facilitate the reigniting of natural processes which are going to cascade down throughout the ecosystem and have an effect good bad and indifferent on, on all species so not about the individual elements it's about the whole yeah that sounds really good as well and you know with other organizations because i was speaking when i was speaking to david last week as well it was about the the interface with other organizations like you know trees for life and saving wildcats and all of those other organizations that are actively working up there you know in, in scotland are you interfacing with some of those as well do you work closely with other companies Obviously. yeah absolutely um i mean trees for life is a, is a case in point david and i are both trustees of, of trees for life so we're very much involved with their work and their work obviously is very complementary to scotland the big picture and hopefully vice versa and there are others as well we've, we've recently been become a, a founding um, partner in the Scottish Rewilding Alliance which is a, a coalition of I think it's 22 organizations now and, and, and interestingly not necessarily the the usual suspects there are the usual suspects present but organizations like Ramblers Scotland for example Mountaineer in Scotland these are these are organizations that wouldn't perhaps ordinarily have had an interest in environmental matters but now can see that the ability of their members or their their, their constituency um, to enjoy what they what they enjoy be it climbing cycling walking whatever is directly impacted upon by the quality of the environment in which those activities take place so again i think the conversation around rewilding is moving very quickly from being one that you know liberal left-wing bunny-hugging vegans had to, to much more of a mainstream societal conversation because it has implications for all of us, you know, whether it's climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, plastics in our ocean, you know, these things are all intertwined and affect us all at, at many, many different levels, some of which we perhaps don't yet fully understand. So yeah, we're, we're very, we, we like to think we work very collaboratively um, with a whole range of organisations. And again, not always those that that you would imagine are, are in line with our vision. You know, we do quite a lot of work with farmers, with fishery boards. These are, these are organizations that perhaps historically, um, you know, we, we would have avoided, or maybe we wouldn't, they may well have avoided us. Um, but, you know, it's only really through having conversations, establishing some common ground and building out from that common ground that, that progress can be made. So we're, we're really very keen on, on 
I hesitate to use the word building bridges, that's one of our projects, but it is exactly that, building bridges across different interests and cultural sectors. Yeah, I think that's a good idea as well, though you have to do that, don't you? You have to get that diversity of, of companies involved. We do the same here with Climate Action North about engaging businesses, more corporate sector businesses, which is really important because they sometimes would never think of, like you say, you know, getting involved with a nature organisation, like doing nature-based activities and linking that back to their own businesses. So we do a lot of work through sustainable development goals, which, you know, you tick so many sustainable development goals just by being involved in certain projects. So I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be quite good for the future, to be honest. I think it's going to be a good, a good driver for people to get involved and, and, you know, get involved with projects that they know can help tick those boxes, but also make a real difference for Rewilden as well. So my other question, I suppose, is I like to ask all of my speakers when I speak to them is about um, what is it you really enjoy doing, Peter? I know that you're a photographer and you're a filmmaker. Is, is there any particular, you know, subject that you like to focus on, you know, more so than being involved in projects with Scotland, the big picture? What do you like doing when you're not doing Scotland, the big picture? <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm, I'm never really not doing Scotland the Big Picture. Yeah, I know the feeling. I'm never really not doing Climate Action North either. But when you do get spare time, what would you like to do? Yeah, I'm, I'm a simple soul, really. I mean, I, I you know, I, we, we live in a fantastic area. I'm very, very fortunate from that point of view. I walk the dog. I, I jump on my bike. Um, I don't necessarily do anything more elaborate than that. I like a bit of football on the television. But I think, you know, what gets me out of bed in the morning is is wanting to contribute to, to something that I consider to be a positive force for good um, and wanting to do my bit, really. That, that's all you can do. Um, and I think, you know, for us that are passionate about environmental issues, that there are only two choices. You, you sit around complaining about the state of the world, and, and we all do that to a certain degree, but that doesn't change it. And, and so the only other choice is to do your best to change it. They are the two options do nothing or do something. And I, and I like to think that I choose to do something. And any more books on the horizon then for Scotland, the big picture or yourself or any of your colleagues, any more books to come? Well, I mean, I think the, 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 the challenge we face really is, 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 is not unique to us by any means. It's trying to understand the, um, the trends that are very, very quickly changing in, in terms of media delivery. Um, you know, you go back five years and I don't thought certainly 10 years, I don't think any of us could have preempted the, the impact of social media, for example. Um, and so for us who are trying to deliver messages across to, to a diverse audience in a, in a myriad of different platforms, it's a question of trying to evaluate what is the best mechanism to do that. I think books, if I'm honest, although I love books, I love these lavish coffee table books that you can feel and smell and touch and you know that that's really what I grew up with but if I'm honest I think as a communication tool they, they probably had their day um, so we're now looking at and, and, and even you know what you would might term standard filmmaking I think again that's probably been done to such a high standard these days there's very little space to go anywhere differently with it I think what we're coming around to, to realizing or, or understanding or appreciating is our, our most effective storytelling tool are people-led stories. So these are stories about people, be they individuals or organizations like Climate Action North, for example, doing really positive stuff in their environment, not necessarily attracting the headlines, but just getting on with it and engaging local people in positive actions. And I think, you know, we are committed to telling as many of those stories as we can. They might be in written form, uh, in terms of photographic format, they might be films, they might be delivered in a whole range of different formats, but in terms of the essence of the message, it's about informing and inspiring people through the actions of other people. So that's really what we're looking at now, trying to tease out stories um, whereby there are, there are very often very local, under the radar projects going on that could be rolled out at much greater scale if others were inspired by those projects. So that's really the kernel we're trying to tease out of this whole 
sort of uh, arena of white noise in the media that we all we all have to try and have our voice heard amongst. Yeah, it's a challenging challenging world at the moment, isn't it? Really, to hear it's um, that almost like that sort of song that Chris Bachman always says about shouting above the noise, which it is. <laughs> you just got to sort of shout as loud. But we just you're very right about what you said. You know, it's best just to get on with things quietly in the background sometimes um, to achieve some real action and that, that's what we're trying to do just get on with stuff every single day and if we're not doing something we, we feel very very guilty about that really it's really it's really quite a hard situation so I suppose if would you like to put out any calls to action to our listeners and our watchers from Climate Action North because obviously we always like to think we can help each other you know if we can help any of your projects by you know, um, talking about them, mobilising some action on them, or you know, putting out some donation uh, links. Is there anything that you wanted to sort of raise awareness of that we could help with? Um, I mean, there's lots of things, lots of ways to get involved with rewilding. You mentioned me wilding was a book that came out of um, came out of our, uh, our conference, really, or, or, or lecture tours that we've been doing over the last eighteen months or so. And people were coming up to us afterwards saying, you know, I, I, haven't, I don't own 40,000 acres in the Highlands. What can I do? I've got a garden or, I, you know, I, I mean, as a consumer, there's all sorts of things you can do. So I think, you know, it, it rewild. I think I suppose the, the take home message really is that rewilding isn't for someone else. It's not for Scotland, the big picture or, you know, Cairngorms Connect. Everybody can get involved in their own way. And that can be through things like the way they manage their garden. It can be about through their consumer choices. It can be about using their vote, using their money, as it, as it were, to, to support organisations. Um, so there's a whole range of ways that different people can get involved. I hope that, that many of those ways will become apparent if you go to our website, which is scotlandbigpicture.com. Um, I hope that some interesting projects on there, the Lynx projects on there, Northwoods is on there, Riverwoods is on there. Um, and there is, a, obviously, as you would expect, a donate page. Um, but really just get involved, follow the rewilding story. You can sign up to our we have this community, this family called Think Like a Mountain. Um, again, you can access that on our, on our website. So, uh, yeah, it's a journey. It's a process. We're on it. We're delighted to be on it. And we'd be equally delighted if other people would join us on it. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. We will certainly share all of the links and everything on our website and on your, your talk on the channel. And have a good rest of the day and good luck with all the projects that you've done. Thanks, Sharon. All the best. Catch you later. Thank you. Bye.